No. Okay. Okay, well, welcome, people. Kathy, I'll let you guide the ambassador up to his spot up here. And uh, if you didn't get a sandwich, please grab one. We're very informal in this crowd, so feel free to get up during the session, grab a coffee, whatever your pleasure. I'll wait for the ambassador to wind his way up here. And uh, I'm Rob Greenwood. I'm executive director, public engagement for the Harris Center. And delighted you're all here. And uh, we are on a tight timeline with the ambassador. We, we want to make the most of him while he's in, uh, in our province. We will have a 25 minute presentation and then we'll have 20 to 25 minutes for Q&A. We are webcasting the session, so some of the Harris Center team will let me know if there's a question that's been emailed in. So we're beaming to the world, uh, Ambassador, so that uh, before I introduce our, our distinguished speaker, uh, I want to, uh, for the land acknowledgement, we respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and the Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatuavut and the Inu of Natasanan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. Uh, we are here in the Geo Center, the Johnson Geo Center, and we're delighted to partner with the Johnson Family Foundation and the Geo Center all the time. We do have our amazing new facility across the road. The Amira Innovation Exchange Conference Center is up and running, still getting wiring, but we've had several sessions and uh, the construction is finished. It's the AV systems and all the boardrooms that are being polished off. So unfortunately, we couldn't have this session today there. But we will continue to use the Geo Center and cross market, and so it's going to be a great partnership. Uh, it is my real pleasure to introduce the Honorable John McCallum. Uh, I have a couple of bios, and I've just met with him and the president of the university before this session, and I think he described having four careers. And his first career, in fact, was as an academic, and it was a year longer than his career as politician, if I remember correctly. And I mentioned to him how I did my master's at York University and did a lot on Canadian political economy. And his PhD thesis was published, and this isn't in his bio, I did not Google it, uh, but a book called, it was published later as a book called Unequal Beginnings. And it compared the industrialization of Southern Ontario and Southern Quebec, if I remember correctly. And I think it had the line in it, the tariff of bad roads, but you didn't remember that. So I have to go back and, and check. But I thought that was a great line and a really important book for me when I was doing my work in, uh, in Canadian political economy. So I knew you long before you were as famous as you are now. Um, Ambassador to, of Canada to the People's Republic of China is his latest assignment. Uh, former member of parliament for Markham, Ontario. Served in six ministerial portfolios, including national defense and immigration, refugees and citizenship. He led the Government of Canada's initiative to welcome 40, over 40,000 Syrian refugees to Canada. He nominated Nelson Mandela as an honorary Canadian citizen. He's former Senior Vice President and Chief Economist with the Royal Bank of Canada, yet another of those careers. PhD from McGill University and had been an economics professor at several Canadian universities and Dean of Arts at McGill. So it's our great honor for the Harris Centre to welcome John McCallum. He's managed to get a little bit of lunch in. And uh, please uh, take the podium, and we look forward to your presentation. When I was a professor, I would talk in 60-minute sound bites. Now it's just a small outside. I'm not sure I'll get up to my allocated 25. A little bit less, but there may be more time for questions. Let me get some other questions by then. But it is a real pleasure for me to be here in Newfoundland and Labrador. I used to come here quite frequently, both as when I was at World Bank, as a client, 
politician to Anderson to to put George Floyd in my family and to take him to back with you today. Um, and I did meet with the senior who's coming to uh, China in November. The delegation. So hopefully all will be seniors. So we we had a four hour talk. And a whole bunch of ministers coming to China. Let me just say a little bit about what we're trying to do in China. You were muted. There we go. Is that better? Oh, okay. So, a year and a half or so ago, I was in Ottawa minding my own business as Minister of Immigration when the Prime Minister asked to see me. And he said, oh, you're doing a great job in immigration and refugees, which maybe took 10 seconds. But how would you like to be my ambassador to China? Because I want to do more in China. Uh, I want to know the ambassador. It's important to me. So I was a bit taken aback. And that thought had never crossed my mind. So I said, oh, well, um, maybe I should ask my wife, which I think was a good answer. And uh, my wife is Chinese from Malaysia, so she was quite keen. So here we are. And it is a wonderful opportunity. And that conversation with the PM is important because since then, I've always said my mandate in China is to do more, more, more. Gong dua, gong dua, gong dua, if you speak Mandarin. Uh, and I mean more in every area, more in trade, more in uh, investment, more in just about every sector you can imagine. And that is what we are trying to do today. And I think today Canada has a unique opportunity to do more because it takes two to tango. And I think the Chinese side wants to do more with us just as we want to do more with them. And partly that's because of the uh, uh, shall we say, the gentleman occupying the White House today uh, with uh, China and uh, can, uh, China and the United States engaging in trade wars of apparently mounting importance. Uh, this gives an opportunity for Canada to do more with China on investment, on trade, because the Chinese are more interested in dealing with us than on dealing in dealing with the Americans. So. You know, as an economist, I think all trade wars are bad, and I hope that Chinese-American trade war, not to mention China-Canada issues on NAFTA, get resolved quickly. But in the meantime, I think it does provide us opportunities. But we have to, those opportunities are there, but they won't happen if we don't seize them. So it's largely up to us, up to me in part, up to the government, up to all Canadians to seize those opportunities while they exist. And so while I'm here in Canada, I'm doing my best to engage various players in Canada, not just in Ottawa, but also here in Newfoundland and elsewhere to engage those opportunities. For example, in talking to the Premier today, I said, you know, we want to attract Chinese foreign direct investment. And there's no doubt that Chinese have a lot of money. Some Chinese have a lot of money, but they don't necessarily know where to invest it. So what we in Canada should do is develop a number of projects, maybe 10, maybe 12, whatever the number, uh, big projects where we would like to see Chinese foreign direct investment, and then give those projects to us in China and we will Find match make, find matches. And I think that's doable. But if you just say, come in, we're open for business, they won't necessarily know what to do. So that's one example of Canada taking the reins to seize the opportunity that is uh, presented to us. Uh, another example is <clears throat> in agriculture. I'm told that the Chinese would be willing to. Uh, have some sort of a contract with Canada that would result in the doubling of pork production in Canada. So are we prepared to seize that opportunity? Is our pork industry wanting to do it? I think that's another opportunity on the table which we should uh, 
certainly engage. And even if not all of these opportunities pan out, I think a good number of them will if we are serious in our efforts to, to uh, do it. And all of these things have one common factor, and that is that they tend to provide jobs in Canada. And so another area that is very important is tourism. This is the Canada-China year of tourism. And we have been having good growth in tourist numbers from China. The objective is to double that number within five years, which may sound big, but it's not that big. China's so big, you have to get, it's hard to wrap the numbers around your head. But even if we doubled the number of Chinese tourists, that would be going from about 700,000 a year to one and a half million. We would still be less than 1% of all Chinese overseas tourists. There's about 140 million of them every year. And so we could triple, quadruple, quintuple, and we'd still be a very small fraction of all the Chinese tourists. But that requires us to get our own act together. First of all, we need more flights. And that's something I am working on very hard because, you know, Chinese tourists don't come in boats or railway car or, or trains. They come in planes and we need enough planes to get them over here. And we need to have efficient visas and we need to advertise our case for Canada and China as opposed to some other place. And we need to have China friendly tourist facilities. Those are all made in Canada challenges. We're making progress in some, but we could still do a whole lot better. So that's just one example where I think we have huge opportunities, including here in Newfoundland. I, I told you we went, my family and I went to Gross Moor, and I think Chinese people would love to come here. It's a little far, I know, but I think with some effort, you could increase quite radically the numbers of Chinese tourists across the whole country, and including here in Newfoundland. And one of the things we're trying to do is to get a direct China flight from, from Beijing or Shanghai to Halifax. And I think that's not St. John's, but it's closer. And so I think that's one thing that would help. And the four Atlantic premiers are united on that objective. So um, Education is another area which is probably the longest standing. I just had a good meeting with the president of uh, Memorial University, and he's going to be in China, and he is very active already in China and wants to become more so, especially in oceanographic areas. And so uh, we will certainly work uh, closely with the university. Um, we also are pushing very much environment and climate change. One of the um, implications of uh, Donald Trump is that the US is no longer a part of the Paris Agreement. So as a consequence, Canada is working much more closely with China than would otherwise be the case on environment and on climate change. We have a, a, a leaders agreement on those issues. Leaders' agreement might sound innocuous and unimportant here in Canada, but I can tell you in China it's important because if you tell the Chinese lower levels of government, oh, we have a leaders' agreement with your leader and our leader, they kind of snap to attention and pay more attention. So that is uh, promoting good cooperation in uh, climate change and clean growth and clean tech industries. Um, I should also say that we don't agree with China on everything. Uh, we're wanting to do more, more, and more with China, but there are obviously some areas, including human rights, including the treatment of Uyghurs, the Muslims in Western China, with which Canada disagrees strongly. And we do speak out on those issues when our leaders come to China, when I speak to Chinese uh, officials. Uh, we always speak out on those areas, and uh, we do this sometimes in private and sometimes publicly sometimes on our own, more often in concert with other like-minded countries like uh, Germany, United States, European Union in, in particular. So I think that's also an important issue to, to mention, even though we at the same time want to do 
uh, more with China in all of these other areas that I have been mentioning. People-to-people -people ties are important in the China-Canada relation. I think one advantage we have as a country dealing with China is that we do have quite a long period of uh, friendship between Canada and China. And I think that dates back to Norman Bethune, uh, who is revered and honored by all Chinese people. Every single one of them has learned about Northern Norman Bethune at school. Um, and so his name is known by all. More recently, we had uh, Pierre Trudeau, early uh, diplomatic recognition of China in 1970, so 2020 will be the 50th anniversary and we will mark that in various ways. Uh, but not to uh, sound like I'm a partisan liberal, John Diefenbaker also had an important role. If you go back to the early 1960s, um, Canada for the first time sold wheat to China at a time where China was having some sort of a famine or a food shortage. And at the time, this was controversial because we were in the middle of the, of the Cold War. And so I think because of these incidents and others, we have built up a strong uh, friendship with China, which, uh, which makes it easier for us to deal with, with China in a, in a productive way. And certainly they liked Trudeau Sr. They also liked Trudeau Jr., our current prime minister who's had a number of successful visits uh, to China. And on the people to people front, I might say that my own family is doing its bit on that front. My wife and I have three sons. Uh, last July, our oldest son got married to a Chinese woman. And just a few months ago in May, our middle son got married also to a Chinese woman. And in a couple of weeks, our third and final son is going to get married. And I think that's the end of the road. I don't think we're going to have any more sons or daughters. And he is also getting married to a Chinese woman. So can't do much more than that, can I? We, I think we're doing our bit on the people to people ties. And as I sometimes say, China may or may not be taking over the world, but they're doing a pretty good job on my family. Or you could say my family is being taken over by Chinese women, and that's a good thing. We're very happy about it. So I think that covers much of what I wanted to say. Uh, I prefer to have questions and answers more than just me talking. So perhaps I'll leave it at that, and I look forward to hearing any questions that you may have. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And as he promised, he delivered short remarks so that we can maximize the Q&A. And we have a superb cross-section of folks here from our province. Uh, we have our former chair of the Harris Center Advisory Board, Dr. Hillary Rodriguez. So great to see Hillary here again. And a, a real mix of people from municipal, industry, uh, provincial, federal. So you've got a great cross-section, community organizations. So we are webcasting, and my staff will let me know when we have an emailed question. Uh, we have a mic that we will bring to you so that you can be heard through the webcast. And uh, we always joke, I don't need a mic, but for these things, I do. And uh, please introduce yourself and uh, make your statement or comments, and uh, we'll have some dialogue. Uh, and I'll keep track of hands, as I always do in these events. So. Don't be shy. Who would like to have the first question or comment? Just right over here, we'll get the mic to you, and you can introduce yourself when you get the mic. Uh, I'm Bonnie Bellick. I'm a reporter with AllNewfoundlandLabrador.com. Um, I know in April you were in China with our Minister Cody and a representative of Aldron. Uh, I just wanted to see what your impression was of those meetings about our clean iron ore and what their impressions were of it as well. Well, we had really good meetings there and we put the parties uh, together. I uh, don't know what the outcome was. 
tell you the truth. Uh, all I know is that it was good to see my old colleague, Siobhan Cody, and we put the parties together. They had a conversation. They then had further discussions. Where it stands now, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Other comments, questions? Oh, over. We're going to make just up. Oh, we have two mics, so. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie Lewis. I'm a filmmaker, both commercial and uh, and drama. Um, I just wondering. I caught it earlier because I was thinking about this, where you said the people to people element, and then you brought it up afterwards. My little boys are a little too young for me to think about them getting married at this point. But <laughs> it's more the people to people thing. You know, we look at Canada these days, and for a long time, and in order to do business in Canada, especially out in some of the provinces, it seems like more and more there's going to be some government involvement at some level. And I see this huge, vast hugeness of China. And, and I see it also as a place where there's huge government influence on everything. So if you're running medium to small, even sized businesses, and you want to do trade or relations with China, can there still be people to people involvement there? Or do you expect that you're going to go straight to the governmental level in China in order to get anything done? And is it possible to do relationships like you could in Canada with people to people and businesses, but they have enough influence or they understand the procedures to go through government and they do that end. How would it work in China? Okay. Those are all very good questions and it's more than one question in a way. Um, I always say to Canadian business people or Canadian ministers coming to China, don't just come to China, come to China often. Because, yes, the government is important in many areas, but it doesn't mean that if you're a small business, you necessarily have to deal with government yourself. The important thing is to establish relationships with your customers, your clients, or perhaps your business partner in China. And relationships are important everywhere, but nowhere are relationships more important than in China, or what they call guanqi, relationships. So if you come to China and meet somebody once, that's okay. You exchange business cards. The second time, you know a bit better. Third time, you're old friends. La Peng Yo. So it's important to come often to establish these relationships, which are important as the foundation for business. So you don't necessarily need to get involved with government, depending on what the nature of your business is. Another uh, tool, which I think is very important, is... Um, <clears throat> e-commerce. Uh, a lot of things can be done through e-commerce. Uh, and we had Jack Ma and Alibaba in Toronto to try to enlist more Canadian businesses to, to use e-commerce. We also deal with JD.com. So that is another vehicle that you can use. And the third thing I should mention is our trade commissioner service. We have more than 100 trade commissioners in, I believe, now 10 cities across China. So they are people to consult about business conditions, about relationships, about anything that you care to know about China. So I think there are a lot of uh, vehicles to um, do this business, and you don't necessarily have to deal with the big government over there. And since you mentioned films and uh, and uh, culture, I would say that another area which I think is extremely blossoming in China is our cultural relationship. Because China has a burgeoning middle class. I forget the number, 300 million or so middle class Chinese, and that number keeps growing every year. And they have tastes the same as our middle class, the same as we do. They want interesting tourist experiences. They want good food, clean, healthy food. They want interesting cultural experiences. And so I think in all of those areas, there's great opportunity for Canada. And Melanie Jolie, who until recently was the culture minister, had a very, very successful trip to China in which they signed agreements with, oh, I think, over $100 million. And she had a very broad cross-sectional delegation from different uh, sides of culture with her and uh, established very good links with her uh, minister. 
Cirque du Soleil is one example, which is very successful in China, and opening its first, its, its permanent uh, place in uh, Hangzhou next year, which is quite exciting and <coughs> I'm sure will be a great success. So I think there are great opportunities in the general area of culture. I'm actually going home today to go to meet a famous uh, Chinese movie star at TIFF at, to see the premiere of her movie called Baby <coughs> and then a reception afterwards. And uh, so we're quite engaged on the cultural side and I do think it's one of the more important areas for future growth. Other right here, uh, Kathy. Hi, uh, my name is Chen Su Park. Uh, I'm a faculty. I'm a faculty member of you know uh, business administration, uh, Memorial University. Um, I've been here five years. You know, in Newfoundland. Uh, originally, you know, I'm ethnically from South Korea. South Korea. Uh, I'm interested in uh, establishing. Uh, you know, the East Asia Business Unit uh, in Memorial. Uh, I'm looking for some uh, funding source or a donor, you know. Uh, I know a couple of, you know, the, uh, such as, you know, Korea Research Foundation. Uh, they are funding for research uh, regarding East Asia or APEC. I know a couple of Japanese foundation. So I don't know, you know, China, so, uh, I need to pay my PhD student to, you know, the graduate student. I need the money. So uh, I, I don't know how to I get uh, those information in China. I also have a question to uh, audience here. Uh, any uh, one working in government sector and, uh, you know, foreign uh, Canada affair or foreign affair and this, I'm looking for connection or, uh, you know, some I, I need your help to establish you know, a business unit uh, specialized in East Asia, uh, China, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. So my question is, um, I'd like to ask you, uh, where can I get those funding source? And then to the audience here, uh, if you are interested in uh, you know, uh, uh, helping uh, establishing East Asian Center Memorial, please let me know. Because you know, I've been here in five, you know, though I'm a new here in Newfoundland. Some Japanese investors would like to spend, uh, would like to invest in Newfoundland. They have a limited information. They don't have any. Uh, of course, they have a, a Canadian, uh, Canada uh, foreign affairs here, but they have a limited information <coughs> to get, uh, you know, the Newfoundland or uh, some connection or this. So <coughs> this. One is to uh, Mr. Uh, John Cannell, the other is for the uh, audience here. Thank you. Okay, I certainly think it's a good idea to pursue this kind of inter-country research for Southeast Asia, Canada. But if you're asking me where you can get the money, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, what I can do is put you in touch with some of the people on my staff who may have ideas of people in China with whom you might wish to connect. But in terms of how you fund yourself, that's not really within my domain. But Kathy, who organized this on behalf of the Harris Center, uh, has contacts with the federal government, helped uh, liaise with uh, Ambassador McCallum. So we can certainly help connect you with them. And there's several people in the room who have lots of expertise and knowledge in that area. So I'd encourage them maybe at the end of the session to uh, get together, but we also can help. Part of the Harris Center role is to broker connections, so we'd be happy to do that. Actually, that was a much more diplomatic answer than mine, and I'm supposed <laughs> to be an ambassador. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think if you can help provide connections mm. to the places in Ottawa that provide the funding. I don't know directly what programs and mm. so on, but I think they do exist, and so we will try to do that. Absolutely. Did you have a separate you're good there? Right. Great. No. Right. So, so Kathy will follow up with you on that to connect with other people. We want to monopolize uh, 
the ambassador today, and we'll let other people speak at separate sessions. Yep, thank you. But I promise we'll follow up. Other questions, comments for the ambassador? Thank you for being here. And afterwards, I'd be happy to talk with you because, uh, well, my name is Elizabeth Vincent. I work at College of the North Atlantic in the international arm. And I handle all of our international business contracts. We are self-funded. We don't receive government aid. So we've learned how to look for pockets of money. There's several people at Memorial as well as Marine Institute who are quite active in that. We'd be happy to meet with you separately to share that information. But now my question for you <laughs> uh, is we've been active in China for 25 years. We've had on an annual basis 300 to 3,000 students in China who have been studying our curriculum. Uh, through oversight, QA, QC, faculty exchanges, mobilities, et cetera, for students. And we've arranged pathways that when they finish with us, that they can go directly into Memorial or into other universities in North America. In this past year, it's become increasingly difficult to continue with those partnerships. And I'm sure a lot of you in this room, including yourself, may have seen the article that came out in July that the Chinese government canceled most partnerships with colleges in Canada because of the new laws that they've introduced for the college system. Luckily, ours have remained, and we have six strong partners there that we are working with. Um, and I think the biggest hurdle that they have is really understanding what a college system is in Canada. And they really uh, struggle with that. And even though we've been there for 25 years and we have strong partners and our partners understand it, getting that message to the appropriate people in the Chinese government has been quite challenging. Um, and I'm just wondering, you did mention education as a priority. When you're in your uh, efforts in advancing education, what is our government doing to educate them on what a college system is? Okay, that's a very good uh, question. I'm not sure if this is related to what you just said, but let me just start by pointing out that in some ways the Chinese government is cracking down more in various ways. They are making it much more difficult for certain foreign NGOs to operate in China. I'm not sure if that's at all related to your issue or not, but that is certainly a fact. So that same attitude might percolate over to your area. I am not uh, sure. In terms of working with uh, China, we have a lot of uh, schools that use provincial curric uh, curriculum in China. We have a lot of universities and colleges that have contacts with China, and those seem to be uh, blossoming. So to be honest, this is the first time I've been asked about explaining to China, to Chinese people, how our college system works, because I hadn't detected a great problem in that area since the relationships in general do seem to be blossoming. And I think I heard you say that your relationship notwithstanding the challenges with your partners, has continued to thrive. I think you said your relationship with your partners in China continues to do well, but the problem is convincing the Chinese of how our college system works. That I don't quite understand. Uh, our established partnerships are thriving, and we continue to grow with them. But our partners in China are asking us to lean on our government to help them while they're leaning on their government to truly make sure that the policymakers in the Chinese government can truly understand what a college system is. Because unless you're a university, a lot of the policymakers in government don't really fully understand what a community college is or even the articulation agreements and pathways that are established through college to university. So while we're maintaining where we are, our concern is if the government doesn't get to that level, should we wish to grow with more partnerships or should one of our partnerships 
not flourish and we look for a new one, to have that key piece and that message to people who aren't educators in government would be really important okay. for colleges. I'm glad you mentioned that to me because I was not really aware that that was an issue. So what I would suggest is that I'll give you my card, you send me an email, and then I'll put you in touch with the person in our group, one of the people that's seized with the education issue, and that, that might be the best way to proceed. Great. Action-oriented synergy session. <laughs> and lovely Memorial College of the North Atlantic synergy there. So. Uh, other comments, questions for the ambassador? Here, the mic to you. <coughs> Hello, um, my, Jim, uh, my name is Jing Huan Yi. I work in uh, effective engineering and applied science at Memorial. Um, and then my question is, uh, again, related to education. Um, I understand that um, in terms of um, education and uh, recruitment, it works in different levels. And from your level, you're at the grant level where in a, it's more strategic, working with the government or the market overall. And now at uh, our level, uh, we frequently travel and uh, meet students and um, parents as well as agencies to promote uh, memorial. And um, there's lots of workforce from the College uh, of the North Atlantic as well. So my question is, um, as compared to US or other markets, right? Um, do you have any strategy to promote um, and for the branding of um, uh, education system in Canada overall? So that helps, you know, for, from our end to enhance, you know, um, our competitiveness as compared to the competitors in US, Australia, and some other, somewhere else. <laughs> okay, well, the short answer is yes. Uh, Chinese, China's a huge market with huge opportunities, but at the same time, we have many competitors. So that is true for tourism. As I said, right now we only have 1%, no, half of 1% of all Chinese overseas tourists. So we don't need a big percent, but we need bigger than we have. And we're in competition with France and UK and Japan and Thailand and US everywhere. Same is true of education. There's a huge demand, uh, and we are actually doing quite well in terms of how many Chinese students we are getting, but we're always in competition with other countries. Um, and what do we do to promote it? Well, we um, facilitate the trips by your president, your university's president, many other university presidents and other leaders come to China and we help to put them in touch with other people, but often they don't need us because they have their own relationships and then they develop other relationships. So they do a good job on their own. If they do need us, we're there. And we also arrange several education markets every year where we uh, go and where Canadian universities and colleges and others participate in selling our wares. So it's a market in some ways. We, we put ourselves up for sale and the Chinese come and look at, look at us. They look at other countries and make a decision. So I think we're quite active in marketing Canada for education. As Justin Trudeau likes to say, better is always possible. I think we're doing a decent job, but I think we could always do better. And just to give you one example on tourism, um, I think we could do a lot better on tourism, on flights, on advertising, etc. Just to give you one example, Australia, in terms of advertising Australia and China, spend ten, spends 10 times as much as Canada. So no wonder more tourists go to Australia. So I think we have to up our game in some of these areas. I'm not sure if we do need to up our game in education. I think we're working pretty hard there. Maybe I'm sure we could do better. But certainly on tourism, um, we're being outspent by a factor of 10 to 1 by Australia. And I think if we're serious about promoting Canada, we could do better in tourism. And I think, finally, uh, there's a question of branding Canada. You know, the Chinese people know about Norman Bethune. But how much do they know about Canada other than that? Uh, so I think that to the extent they do know, they Canada has a strong reputation for clean, healthy food, uh, for beautiful places to visit. 
but not enough people know. And so there was a Branding Canada program, which the previous government canceled, which we're thinking of reestablishing. It would be partly for agriculture, but also could be for tourism, also for Canada in general, where, which would be an effort to make the Chinese more aware of Canada for all sorts of reasons, whether it's education or tourism or buying our goods, whatever. So there's a lot of work to do, huge opportunities, but we should also be aware that there's also huge competition from all sorts of other countries. Another question at the same table. Hi, Ambassador. Uh, my name is Greg Stamp. I'm with the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, which is a branch of the government of Canada. Just wondering, uh, as I you know, know about that. I know about you. <laughs> yeah, I was just there, there? there you a come. few days ago in PEI. Yeah. As you know, uh, countries around the world are increasingly looking to um, the oceans of the world as a, as a way to uh, increase GDP and uh, including things like, you know, uh, uh, you know, feed a growing population estimated to grow by, a, I think, a billion by 2030. And I'm just wondering, you know, you might be aware that uh, Atlantic Canada was just awarded funding for an ocean supercluster. Yeah. And uh, as one of the many superclusters across the country, just wondering if you're aware of any particular opportunities or areas of focus, perhaps for Chinese, Canadian, Atlantic Canadian, um, you know, engagement, both, you know, at, the, at, you know, the SME level and, and larger than that and institutional levels and all that on the oceans front. Well, I just had a conversation with the president of your university about that, and he's very keen on pursuing those things while in China. And I know that supercluster is important also to the premier. I was talking to earlier today. So your own people from Newfoundland and Labrador, premier, university president, no doubt others, ministers, will be pursuing that while they are in China in uh, November. Also, Navdi Bings, the ICED minister, will be there. Um, so, I think there are a number of people working on your behalf uh, in that area, and uh, we will support them through our Trade Commissioner service to try to help them to get to the right people. So, I do think uh, that is one of, not a huge number, a, a certain number of superclusters, which is of particular relevance to this region, and I think uh, you have a number of advocates going to China in the near future to press that case. That's great. Ambassador? Other, yes, over on this side, we'll get the mic to you, sir, before you, you can introduce yourself too, also, please. Sorry? Introduce yourself. Sorry. Larry Steffen with the Pure Canadian Preserves. Uh, coming back to your point about branding Canada, how should we be looking to support, participate, uh, in that effort, uh, design of labels, how else can we, in how strong should we project an image of Canada, and what image is it that we should be projecting? We happen to be dealing, uh, considering products that will be made from our own indigenous wild berries, which we understand at this point. Uh, blueberries particularly are much sought after in China. Because they become, they are, we understand, becoming more uh, aware of the health benefits. But coming back to Canada, how should we be participating in branding our products to tie in with the overall program of branding Canada? Okay, that's a good question to which I don't have a complete answer. Because <coughs> there's a lot of people in Ottawa right now talking about that very question. and there isn't a clear answer yet emerging. Um, I think we need to talk to professionals who are professionally expert in branding. Now, I think what I can say is what I hear others say. I don't know if it's the best way to do it, but what, how we often advertise ourselves and what Chinese people know Canada for are things like on the food front that we have healthy food and we have clean food and we are reliable in terms of food 
And there have been a number of scandals in China involving baby milk, involving uh, uh, animal diseases of one kind or another. So they are very sensitive on the safety and sanitary conditions of their food. And that's reflected in their very tough regulatory system. But I think one way of branding Canada is our safety, our pristine healthiness, and that feeds off into um, the tourism side. I mean, we can advertise our Gross Morn or Rocky Mountains or Niagara Falls. Those are more the traditional things that Chinese go to, but the Chinese are evolving. Some of them are interested in different things, like exciting cities, not just beautiful scenery. So there's a whole lot of different sides to Canada. And to be effective, I think it has to be pretty simple. You know, it can't be 101 different things. And I'm not a communication expert. So I think what we have to do is engage some professional expertise to come up with the best answer. But those are just some areas, some ideas I have heard, but I don't think we've come to the final answer to that yet. I think we have time for one, if it's brief, maybe two more questions or comments. Already on your table. Distinguished gentleman at the back there, yes, sir. Ambassador Derek Buller with the Association of Seafood Producers, and, and not so much a, a question, but a thank you to yourself, the embassy, the trade commissioners, the network throughout China, the importance of the trade missions for expanding business opportunities in China. I want to underscore that for people. Um, we've been selling seafood, as I've said, for 500 years, as long as we've been here. China is unique, and the importance of both the embassy, the trade commissioner service, the missions in building relationships, in touting the leaders part of agreements and relationships, the business meetings, the meetings that take place between the prime minister, ministers, and the president and respective ministers in China, very important in terms of media presence in China. And uh, just wanted to say, for the sake of the room, the number one uh, sea seafood product sold in China is Canadian shrimp in e-sales. The number one internet seafood sold is Canadian shrimp, which is pretty impressive. It tells you about the growth in the coal chain uh, throughout China in just, in just the last 10 or 15 years that we've been able to achieve that. And we do it through Canadian branding. Very important. We'd love to talk to you about that. It's a large Canadian branding component to that. So, so thank you for your work. And I guess some of our members will be seeing you in China in November. Oh, thank you. Well, as a former politician and currently ambassador, maybe that's a good question on which to end the session. <laughs> so thank you. And I think seafood has been one of our biggest successes. But maybe there's time for one more. Yeah, we have time for one more. If someone has another, yep, gentleman here. Ross Han, I'm a retired elementary teacher. And uh, since retiring, I've been doing a fair bit of tutoring with Chinese students such as this from the university. And I've enjoyed it immensely. Uh, a problem that I see sometimes after they graduate, they're, there's difficulty finding a job, especially here in Newfoundland. The opportunities are limited. I'm just wondering if there's much collaboration between government and business to make that process a little easier. Because we are receiving some of the best students from China. And they could really be a, what's the right word? <laughs> uh, benefit to our country, right? The other question is, what's your success with Chinese women? Yeah. <laughs> My success from a family point of view, as I've just pointed out, is very high. <laughs> I have three daughters-in-law now, or about to be three, all Chinese. So I think I'm doing quite well on that front. And my wife is Chinese. And my granddaughter, my first child, grandchild, is three quarters Chinese. So I don't think you can fault me on the Chinese front. Or my secret. I'm just so charming, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but on your question, you don't need to convince me when I was immigration minister, I would say again and again and again ad nauseum that Canada had an aging population and the best source of, for us for new citizens was international students because they're young, they're educated, they speak English or French, 
They know something about the country, and they're just what we want. So we made it easier for students to become landed immigrants, permanent residents. And so I don't think the government has changed since I left. I think we're still very keen to uh, welcome as permanent residents uh, overseas students, not least from China. Um, but we can't guarantee everybody a job. You know, it's up to them to find a job at the end of the day. Government can provide assistance in various ways, but uh, it's up to them at the end of the day to find a job. And the other thing I would say about Chinese students is that in the old days, almost all of them wanted to stay in Canada if they could after graduating. But that's no longer the case necessarily, because China is changing a lot, and China is getting richer, and China is doing very well. And so China today sees itself not only as an exporter of students to get trained in Canada, but also as an importer of students from all around the world to get trained in China. And there are a lot of well-paid, very interesting jobs in China. So not every Chinese student coming to Canada necessarily wants to stay in Canada. They may well want to go back to China, or they may well want to go back and forth between the two. So the world is evolving, but I certainly am 100% in agreement with the idea that as many uh, Chinese and other overseas students who want to stay on permanently in Canada, that's a good idea. And okay, that, that's it. That Thank is our all. last. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you, sir. I'm going to reach behind you for that book. And I have a couple of concluding remarks, but first I'd love to present to the ambassador a book that uh, I have a chapter in, that my first trip to China was ah. to Hainan before Christmas, uh, organized by the Institute of Island Studies at UPEI, and we're partners at Harris Center with that group on a regular basis. And Hainan was an eye-opener for me, and uh, certainly we chatted a bit about it before the, the session. And it's an ongoing relationship, and our, our president highlighted to the ambassador the many instances our Marine Institute and various departments and faculties have ongoing relationships. And so you've brought a lot more uh, light to the, uh, the enormous opportunity. And we look forward to using you and your staff on a, a go-forward basis, okay. as I say. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And very quickly before you leave, uh, these sessions are webcast. Thank you to those of you who viewed on the web. And they are archived on our website. So this is a resource that many of our faculty use uh, all the time. There's lots of them there already, previous Synergy sessions. Um, we will be hosting over at the Amira Innovation Exchange. The uh, official first official conference will be October 25 to 27, People, Place, and Public Engagement. We have Ted Hewitt, the president of Shirk, will be there. Nate Nobed, the political leader for the Inuit in Canada, has agreed to present. We'll have a Newfoundland and Labrador arts panel on the role of MUN with the creation of CODCO and all the amazing stuff. So it's going to be a hoot. We had over 125 submissions to present from Australia, Russia, Norway, UK, across Canada, US, etc. So that's my pitch for the day. Um, and we really look forward to a lot more ongoing program of Synergy Sessions and Memorial Presents using the new center as well as uh, partner facilities. Kathy Newhook is our lead on Synergy Sessions and Memorial Presents. So keep in touch with her with any ideas. Thanks a million for coming out, and I hope you brought a coat. And maybe the rain has passed over by now. Thanks again to the ambassador. Wonderful.